Welcome to episode 15. To start the programme, we return to Gordon Young with another wildlife in Maru clip. This time, Gordon focuses on the Mulcair River, of which over five miles passes through Maru. Hello again for this second episode of Maru Wildlife and if we haven't had enough of it I'm going to be talking about water and some of our wildlife associated with it. But before we do that just ignore wildlife for a second and look at this lovely bridge we have crossing the river down in Abingdon. Let's first look at the dipper. This small bird, larger than a robin but smaller than a blackbird, can often be seen in the fast flowing shallow water near a bridge where it will often build its nest. Watch it closely and you will see it walk underwater where it catches insects to eat. They can often be seen sitting on a rock, bobbing up and down. All rivers around Maru have their breeding pairs of dippers. Let's look at this video clip of a dipper at Bilbo Bridge, feeding its young in a nest under the bridge. Watch the way it goes from rock to rock as it approaches the nest. The other water bird that everyone wants to see is the kingfisher. All our rivers have them, but the most you usually see is a fleeting glance of blue as they fly low across the water. It spotted you first. A good place to look for them though is at our bridges. They like shallow water where they can easily see the small fish that they dive down for from a branch. Some fishermen have even spoken of them landing on the end of their rods, but perhaps this is just fishermen's tails. They breed in a tunnel which they excavate in the bank of the river. However, this leads them at danger when rivers are in flood as the water rises and washes their young away. We wait to see how successful they were in breeding this year. And now for a water bird that I'm sure you all must have seen, the grey heron, one of our largest birds. Being large, of course, makes it easy to see. You will nearly always see this bird on the edge of the lakes in Glenstall. There they will catch fish, frogs, mice, and I've even seen one eating a rat. They breed fairly early in the year in a colony, usually in trees. Although in Connemara, where there are no trees, they breed on rocks on small islands in the lakes and the sea. And now for the grey wagtail. Easily distinguished from our only other wagtail, the pied, because of the yellow under the tail. We don't have the yellow wagtail at all in Ireland, so can't be confused with them. Although sometimes people call the grey wagtail the yellow wagtail. In summer, it is always associated with fast-flowing shallow rivers, which have a good insect life. In winter, in cold conditions, they may roam further afield. Let's look at a clip of a grey wagtail on the river at Abington, wagging its tail up and down and then darting out to catch an insect and returning to the same perch. Very typical behaviour of this bird. Let's leave the birds behind and take a look at two of our mammals associated with water. First, the otter. Rarely seen as they mainly come out at night, they can be found in quite a few areas on the mole care system. Otters, of course, mainly eat fish. They really like eels. But they will also eat birds, insects, frogs and even small mammals if they come across them. Otters actually can breed at any time of the year. Ireland has the highest density of otters in Europe. While we are looking at the otter, it is worth mentioning the work of the Mulcair Life Project and the Mulcair Conservation Volunteers, who are doing great work on improving the Mulcair River system, including building artificial otter halts along the river. The otter halt is the den for the otter. The bridge at Anacotti has a nice painting illustrating their work. And do look at the website by googling Mulcair Life Project. 
When I was out filming the Dippers, I came across the Mulcair Life Project leaders with children from the Dunes School where they were looking at this young eel they had caught. They put it back again. The American mink, an introduced species, is now well established on our rivers and streams. Very weasel looking. Uh, they eat small birds, chicks, etc. rather than fish. Much, much smaller than the otter and often seen away from the water. Just a quick look at some damsel dragonflies to remind ourselves that there are many more species than just mammals and birds. Here's a small diving beetle in a pond. And some whirly gigs, which are always fun to watch. Just before we finish, I hope you all got down to see the early purple orchids, which I mentioned in my last talk in, in spring. Spring seems a long time ago now, but these orchids really were spectacular until they were cut down. I have to wait for them again until next year. So thanks very much for listening. I hope you enjoy what I've put together, and I hope to do another one soon. Bye. The monument is a very prominent feature of the Maru village landscape. Limerick historian Tom Toomey will now tell us about the monument itself when it was erected and who is commemorated on it. The Republican Monument at Maru is probably the first of, of significant size to be constructed in the country. Uh, the sculptor of the monument was a man named Gaffney from Waterford who was a very famous sculptor at the time. And the driving force behind the memorial was Michael Hayes who had been very active in the War of Independence. Michael Hayes was from Moher, and he was a brother to Canon John Hayes, the founder of Minturnatira. As I say, the monument was unveiled in 1923. Uh, most of the work was done uh, during the Civil War. Uh, the east-facing uh, side of the monument honours Brigadier Sean Wall from Brough. Sean Wall was the commandant of the East Limerick Brigade and he was killed at Newtown uh, Anacarty, County Tipperary on the 6th of May 1921. The other two names on the east facing side of the monument are from from Maru men. Adjutant Patrick Ryan who came from Anna near Maru and Lieutenant John Frahill, who was from Ra near Maru. The two, these two men uh, were great friends and they died side by side at the Kelly on May the 2nd, 1921, where the IRA uh, had been ambushed by the Green Howard Regiment. On the left hand side of the monument, facing north, there is a, a plaque dedicated to the men of the Mid Limerick Brigade. Now, Maru Company uh, was part of the Castle Connell Battalion, which was also part of the Mid Limerick Brigade. And this plaque is dedicated to 14 men from Mid Limerick who were killed in various sections during the War of Independence. James Horden was killed at Strahala on the 1st of May 1921. Timothy Hennessy was wounded at Strahala and died subsequently in, in a hospital in Cork. Patrick Casey from Caharelli Ballybricken was captured at Strahala on the 1st of May and taken to Cork where he was tried by court martial on the Monday the 2nd of May and executed at half six on Monday evening. Conrine Vora 
was from Clantine near Capamore, and he was killed uh, erecting a roadblock between Dune and Capamore in May 1921. Henry Clancy was from Limerick City. Henry Clancy was a soldier in the Warwickshire uh, Battalion of the British Army in the First World War, but he joined the IRA when he returned to Ireland, and he was killed at Bally Simon. On the also on the May, 1st of May 1921. His, compa his comrade that day, Thomas Keane, was captured and Keane was tried by court martial in the new barracks, now Sarsfield Barracks in Limerick, and he was executed on the 4th of June, Saturday the 4th of June 1921. Michael Downey was also from Limerick City and he was shot dead uh, on the day of Henry Clancy's funeral. Thomas Blake was from the New Street in Limerick and he was killed by a, a British murder squad under Captain George Montague Nathan uh, near the Redemptorist Church in January 1921. Joseph O'Donoghue was from Balnacargi in County Westmeath and he managed a meat shop in Limerick. He was taken from his digs. He was staying in Jamesborough Avenue uh, with a family called Liddy's. And he was taken from Liddy's house on the 6th of March 1921. And he was shot dead uh, a few yards from the house. The George Clancy, known, better known as Georgia Clancy, was the mayor of Limerick and he was also killed on the same night as Joseph O'Donoghue when the murder squad under, jo under George Montague Nathan visited his house and they, when Clancy opened the door he was shot dead. Richard Leonard was from Ballybrood. He was killed at Ballybrood. He was taken from his house, from his sister's house actually, on the 31st of December 1920 and he was shot a few yards from the house. Edmund Donnelly was one of four men who were fatally burned to death at the burning of Croom Courthouse in June 1921. Patrick Starr was from Nina. He was fighting with the mid Limerick Flying Column and he was fatally wounded also at Strahala side by side with James Horden and Timothy Hennessy. Michael O'Callaghan was the ex-mayor of Limerick who was also murdered on the same night as George Clancy by the same uh, death squad under George Montague Nathan. On the west side of the monument there are 12 names from the East Limerick Brigade and 4 names from the West Limerick Brigade. The first of the East Limerick men is Patrick Clancy from Coosh near Kilfinnan, who was killed at Derry Gallen near Cantork in County Cork in August 1920. John Reardon was another ex British soldier who died from his wounds from wounds received in an ambush at the Red Gate near Gary Spillane. In December 1920. David Tobin and Thomas Murphy uh, were shot dead at Balnalacken near Glenbrahan when they were surrounded by a British patrol on New Year's Day 1921. Tommy Howard was shot and killed the same day as Frahel and Ryan at Le Kelly. Howard was killed alongside William O'Reardon. Uh, both of them were part of the East Limerick Flying Column and they were killed on uh, Fitzpatrick's land as Le Kelly. Martin Conway was the OC of the Grange Company. Conway organised the Cahar dance at Cahagillamore on the 26th uh, of December 1920 when the dance was surrounded by Crown Forces and 
a number of volunteers, including Conway, were killed. Patrick Quinlan was also one of the men killed at Cahagillamore. Michael Scanlon was from Galbley. He was a teacher in Kilmallock and he was OC of the Kilmallock Battalion. He was captured in a roundup in October 1920 and brought into Limerick. When he reached William Street Barracks, Scanlon made a break for freedom and he was eventually cornered and shot in a cellar in Thomas Street in Limerick. The next man on the list is Liam Scully. Liam Scully was a Gaelic League teacher from Glencar in County Kerry, who was the only fatality at the attack on Kilmallock Barracks in May 1920. William Slattery, Willie Slattery, was from near Emley. He was originally from Ballinamfrina uh, near Kilfinnan, but he was living with an uncle near Emley and farming his uncle's land. He was taken prisoner uh, on the 26th of, this, of, of December 1920, and he was shot on the way to Tipperary, uh, to Tipperary Military Barracks. The last man from East Limerick on the list is J James Jossie O'Mara. O'Mara was killed uh, near Embley in May 1921 when he was spotted crossing a field by a detachment of black and tans who opened fire. There are four men from the West Limerick Brigade on the same side of the monument. They are Commandant Sean Finn, who was killed at Ballyhahel on the 31st of March 1921. Finn was the Commandant of the West Limerick Brigade, but he was a very young man. He was only 21 years of age, and he'd originally been a baker from the town of Ratkeel. The next man is Patrick Dalton, who was killed uh, at Gotdadlana uh, Got uh, in County Kerry in May 1921. Uh, the shooting of Dalton and his three comrades is known today as the Valley of Nakanur. Dalton, Walsh and Lyons, and one man escaped, Condé. Uh, Timothy Madigan was from Clash Ganov near Golden, Shanna Golden, and he was killed on St. Stephen's Day 1920 uh, when Black and Tans raided his house, and as he attempted to escape, he was fired on and killed. The last man on the listing is Patrick O'Brien. Patrick O'Brien was killed in an explosion at Tally Ho Bridge near Arda in May 1921. What appears to have happened was that the Irish destroyed the bridge. The Black and Tans came on the scene and they, uh, they repaired the bridge and filled it in. And in the course of filling it in, they attached uh, a grenade to a stone, uh, knowing that the IRA might come back to destroy the bridge for a second time. And sure enough, the IRA returned. And while O'Brien was lifting a flat stone, the grenade exploded and killed him in May 1921. Those are the uh, plaques to the 33 men. There were more men from Limerick killed during the War of Independence, but it is a very good representative group of men who gave their lives for Ireland in the period. In this programme, we have another song from Powers Pub, The Ploughlands in Abington. This time, Mike Hanley is singing Miss Fogarty's Christmas Cake. Oh, it's on. Yes. Now, yeah. what are we going to do? That's the button now. It's a long time since I've touched anything. Right. Oh, Christ, I'll have to try and do something. Yes, I'm going to do it. Well, head off. As I sat at my window last evening, Lovely. the lesson man brought it to me. A little request invitation saying, Good holy, come over to tea. 
Sure ain't no Mrs. Fogg up descended A little bit on from ship's egg And the first thing they gave me to tackle Was a slice of Miss Fogg up this cake There were Plums and prunes and cherries There were citrons and raisins and cinnamon too There were nutmeg, cloves and berries And of course it was stuck on with glue There were caraway seeds in abundance Sure to build up a fine stomach ache It would kill a man twice after eating a slice of Miss Fogarty's Christmas cake. <laughs> Miss Mulligan wanted to taste it, but really there wasn't no use. They watched it for over an hour, but they couldn't get none of it loose. Then Fogarty went for the hatchet, and Kelly came in with the saw. That cake was enough with the powers to paralyze any man's jaw. There Boys were plums and prunes and cherries. There were citrons and raisins and cinnamon too. There were not make cloves and berries. And the cost it, it was stuck on with glue. There were caraway seeds in abundance. Sure to build up a fine stomach ache. It would kill a man twice after it. In the slice of Miss Fogarty's Christmas cake. Maloney was took with a colleague. Magnolty complained of his head. Macfadden lay down in the sofa and he swore that he wished he was dead. <laughs> Miss Holy lay down in hysterics and there she did wriggle and shake. Sure everyone swore they were poisoned for eating Miss Fogarty's cake. There were plums and prunes and cherries. There were citrons and raisins and cinnamon too. There were nut cloves and berries and of course it was done with low. There were caraway seeds in abundance that would build up a fine stomach ache. It would kill a man twice after eating a slice of Miss Fogg of this Christmas cake. The longest horse-drawn procession in the world took place in Glenstall, Maru in 1989. Let's look back with the video clip. As far as the eye can see, that's the target of Maru Festival, as it organises an exciting attempt on the world record for the longest horse-drawn carriage procession. Spectacular cavalcades of horse-drawn carriages will set out from the four corners of Ireland and will converge on the scenic Glenstall Abbey on Sunday, August 13th, where they will try to break the world record. Television and radio personality and marathon walker Dunica O'Dooling will lead a cavalcade on its winding way from Dublin to Glenstall. Right folks, right folks, let's and head Donnick O'Dooling of RTE led the vehicles from Limerick out to Maru. Donnick had travelled from Dublin in a pony and trap during the previous days. After a full year's preparation, the longest horse-drawn procession in the world took place in Glenstall, Maru on the 13th of August 1989. It was located in Humphreys and Gow's farms. Horse-drawn vehicles came from all over the country, Limerick, Galway, Dublin and Waterford, and all points in between, converging on Maru on the 13th of August. The horse-drawn vehicles were measured by Ger Egan, Thomas Holmes, Mike Kett and Dennis Holmes at Herbert Gow's passageway.
There were prizes in the various categories for presentation of horses and vehicles. John Meehan was the overall winner with his horse-drawn hearse. It was a very spectacular event indeed.
Father Ryan is currently on holidays, so we have deferred a thought for the week to the next episode, and we will finish now with the sports results. Kamogi with Caroline Hickey, Maru AFC with Noel Regan, and the GAA with Philip D. At present, the Camogie scene is relatively quiet, with all age groups getting ready for championship. This is a roundup of the year so far. The under 12s are doing really well. They won all seven league matches. However, there was no cup as it was a non-competitive league. They, they have played one blitz where they won all their matches. Uh, there was four girls picked to represent the East and County. They were Neve Clossy, Hazel Harrigan, and Adele and Caroline Cunningham. Karen, Karen Cunningham. They played a blitz, one in Killarney, which they won the final, and the other in Care. This was a non-competitive blitz, but they still won all their games. Adele Cunningham went on to represent Limerick on the primary games team that played at halftime in the Munster quarter final against Limerick and, Tipper Limerick and Tipperary in Thurlis. There was three girls picked in the East Development Squad. They were Orla Regan, Leonie Kelly and Amy O'Halloran. They played one blitz in Raquel and won all their games. Uh, they are currently on a break from training but will return in mid-August where they will have an upcoming blitz and the first round of the championship to prepare for. The under-14s also had a successful league campaign where they won the under-14C league final, beating Cap Moore by two points. Mary O'Reilly accepted the, the plaque on behalf of the team. They are currently on a break from training but will return, return soon to get ready for a championship which starts on the 21st of August. The under-16s who joined with Captain Moore also had a successful league campaign, reaching the semi-final, which unfortunately they lost out on an extra time. They will resume training in the coming weeks, prepare for a championship, which starts the 24th of August. And finally, the intermediates had a good league, league run, getting to the league final, only to lose out to a better Adair team. They are back training and playing as many challenge matches as they can to keep them focused and be ready for a championship, which begins on the 19th of August. Thanks. Um, this is the Maru AFC notes for the past couple of weeks. The um, season is quite enough now at the moment, and the only team playing competitive soccer at the moment is our senior ladies team and they're certainly flying the flag high for the club. Um, they've played a number of matches recently and they've continued their excellent form since the beginning of the season. Wins in the league over Brough uh, 5-1 and was followed up by a 6-0 win over Herbertstown to leave Maru on maximum points after six matches. A 2-2 draw followed away to Knock Long which left the girls one victory away from securing the league title. Uh, the league title then was secured last Thursday evening uh, courtesy of a 5-2 victory at home to Herbertstown. Uh, it's an excellent campaign to have the league title secured with three matches still to go and the ladies are still undefeated in their own division and, and in local cup competitions as well. The girls also had a brilliant 3-1 win away to Clambell in the National Junior Cup and they advanced to play Crosshaven in the last 16. Um, they travelled to Crosshaven last weekend and secured a 3-0 victory courtesy of goals either side of half-time by Neve Richardson and a Patricia Butler effort which secured them a quarter-final spot in the national competition. The ladies will continue their travels with another trip away, at uh, this time travelling to the capital Dublin to take on Finglas on July 29th. And finally, the other news I suppose of note in the club at the moment is that the FAI soccer camp started uh, today, Monday the 16th, and runs for the rest of the week. Uh, we, uh, yet again this year we have an excellent attendance with nearly 100 uh, kids from the locality participating and uh, we're sure a great week will be had by all. And finally, just again, just to wish the ladies the very best of luck in their semi-final match away to Finglas on the 29th. Thank you. Hi, hello, Philip D, Secretary of Marubo GA Club. Um, it's, uh, I haven't been on this for a while, so I have a bit of catch-up to do. Um, first of all, I suppose I'd like to say the club and the community were saddened at the recent passing of Henry Cooney of Belligai, former chairman of Marubo GA Club, chairman of Eastport GA and uh, the Public Relations Officer for Limerick County Board at one time as well. Henry was a very big man uh, physically, but he was a giant figure in GAA terms, who worked tirelessly for club and county all his life. Henry is a tremendous loss. Uh, the club members and members of East Board and County Board GAA formed a guard of honour at Henry's funeral as a mark of respect for a great gale. Our heartfelt sympathy extends to Mary and family at this time. May he rest in peace. 
Uh, I just want to give a, a, a brief overview of where we are with the minor hurling, the junior B hurling and the senior and the senior team hurling at this point. Um, the minor hurling, three rounds uh, were played, well technically played, we have two wins and we got a walkover. Uh, our two wins were in the first round against Capamore, second round against Palace Green, very big wins on both occasions and we got a walkover last Friday week from uh, South Liberties who couldn't field the team. We have a stiff test next Friday versus Mona Lean at Harty Park in Maru. But Mona Lean will be one of the top teams in our group. Um, after that we have um, to play Cusix, which is an amalgamation between uh, Krakora and Clahan. Next in is Nave Breed, which is uh, Kiltili Drumkeen and Caroline, I think, combined, and Ahan in the last game. Junior B hurling, we failed to qualify for the knockout stages of the league due to narrow losses against Capamore and South Liberties, but we did very well overall. We drew with Caroline in the first round. We beat uh, Belly Bricken. We got a walkover from Palace Green. We play Dune possibly next Saturday in the Brian Butler Cup final. Venue has yet to be decided. There is a tremendous interest for the last, I'd say, nine or ten weeks at this level with separate training from the senior panel and very high numbers for Junior B at Challenge Games. We play Clahan, Ahan, Narcaney and Gary Spillane. And uh, there's several other clubs in fact in the last two months preparing for the East Championship in August. The management team there of course the Junior B is Joe McNamara, Johnny Bryan and Oliver Foley. Um, the minor hurling, I should have said, the management, the management team is myself, Philip D. Uh, Tom Lynch, John Kennedy and Mike Kitt. Senior hurling, we won our first match in the championship against the Han. I would have covered this earlier on. We had a great win in Capamore on the day. We lost the second round uh, to Kilmallock. We have our third round in the championship against Knockaney, probably around the August weekend. It's not fixed yet. Uh, and that's a very, very big game for us. It's do or die, really. I believe we're playing Lick Snow of Kerry next uh, next Thursday in Newcastle West. We're going reasonably well in the league. We won the first round against Hospital Harborstown. We drew with Patrick Swell in Patrick Swell in the second round. We beat South Liberties in Bohor, lost rather heavily to a hand in New Garden about three weeks ago. And last Sunday week we played in a Piercic in Cahardavon. We lost by 15 points to 13 points um, in a game that we should really have won. So. That's all. Until the next time, thanks very much.